All right, so for the last week, we have been talking all about ionic bonding, right? Well, we're going to kind of switch gears now. We're going to now talk about covalent bonding. And the best thing for you guys to do is compartmentalize them as two completely separate things. Yes, they're both bonding. Yes, we're going to learn how to name both of them. But at the same time, they are completely separate things. So try not to combine them. They're two completely different concepts. So first of all, before we do covalent bonding, I just want to review these few terms. An element is one type of atom, so like gold. That's an element. doesn't matter how many atoms of gold I have, it's still an element because it's just gold. A compound is two or more atoms bonded together like water, H2O. So we actually have three atoms combined together, correct? Combined. Combined, thank you. Okay, and then we also have a mixture. A mixture is two or more elements or compounds mixed together. So things that are mixed together, we can separate relatively easily, correct? Things that are combined together in a compound, we cannot separate relatively easily. Okay, so we spent a little bit of time last, the last week and a half or so talking about ionic bonds. And ionic bonds, if you remember, transfer electrons. So we make a formula unit. So for instance, sodium and chlorine. Sodium gave his electron to chlorine, so sodium is now happy and chlorine is now happy. So, but the transfer of electrons was 100%. There was no sharing going on. Okay, covalent bonds, however, are the opposite. These share electrons. Basically, covalent compounds are nonmetals. And if you look at the periodic table, nonmetals have high electronegativity. So if your electronegativity is the tug of war in electrons, so is anybody going to win? Not necessarily, because they're both really strong. So they're just going to kind of fight back and forth on the electrons. So instead of both of them not following the octet rule, so both of them being unhappy, they're going to share the electrons so they can both be happy some of the time. Okay, so in ionic compounds, ionic compounds are made out of ions, and they do ionic bonding. So it was really easy to keep those three together, right? Ions do ionic bonding and make ionic compounds. Covalent compounds, not so much. Covalent compounds do, are created from covalent bonds. However, they make something called a molecule. Did I go too fast? Did I go too fast? Okay, they make something called a molecule. So molecules are things that are covalently compounded together. Okay, A molecule is a neutral group of atoms joined together by covalent bonds. So just like an ionic, ionic bonding, we have to be neutral, which means that nobody is gaining or losing any electrons. They are just sharing. And then we have something called a diatomic molecule, which we have talked about before, right? We talked about diatomic molecules when we were learning the periodic trend of atomic size, and this is how we determine the size of an atom. We measure the distance between two nuclei of a diatomic molecule. Now, there are seven elements that exist in the diatomic form, which means that they are never, ever, ever by themselves. They are always going to be found in pairs. It's like they're twins. Okay. Oxygen is never going to be found by itself. He's either going to be in a compound or he's going to be in a pair. And so is hydrogen, so is bromine, so is iodine, so is nitrogen, so is chlorine, and so is fluorine. And you need to know these. Honestly, the more we do it, you guys will start to pick up on it. But I'm going to show you a trick to remember, and we have to use the periodic table in the classroom. So I want everybody to look back at the periodic table in the classroom. Okay, the diatomic molecules, there are seven of them, and they make a seven on the periodic table. So I want everybody to find nitrogen. Everyone see nitrogen number seven? Yes. Nitrogen number seven is also the first red element in, on that side of the periodic table, right? So we start with nitrogen and we start to make seven. Hmm. We go nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. And how do I know to stop there? Because I have Start with red, what are our metal rules? Start with red, there they are. 
I decided to dive on the water with wide number eyes, and you can learn how to read this, correct? But how many is that? Six. Six. And how many are there? Seven. Seven. Of course, hydrogen never follows you. Every single time you learn something new in chemistry, what do I always say? Hydrogen doesn't follow you. So, here is the six of them, and then throw them in. All right, so let's, just like with ionic compounds, let's look at some characteristics of molecular compounds. Molecular compounds tend to have lower melting and boiling points than ionic compounds, which means that at room temperature, they're usually going to be gases or liquids, which if we look up at the periodic table, I just told you covalent compounds are usually nonmetals, and if you look up at the periodic table, most of the nonmetals are what color up there? Red. What does the color red mean on the periodic table? Anyone? Just told you five seconds ago. Gases. Red means that they are gases. Blue means they are liquid. Black means they are solid. So molecular compounds tend to be gases or liquids at room temperature, which makes sense because most of our nonmetals are gases and liquids. And most importantly is this th third bullet. This test is over ionic and covalent compounds. So you guys need to be able to identify which is which to be able to name them correctly, to be able to draw them correctly, so on and so forth. Honestly, all you have to do is look for a metal. If it's a metal, it's an ionic compound. If there's non-metals, it's a covalent compound. All you're doing is looking for the presence of a metal. All right, so covalent means to be strong or to be together, which means covalent bonds are actually really strong bonds because they are sharing electrons. Usually covalent bonds are made by nonmetals, and the reason the way covalent bonds work is nonmetals tend to keep their valence electrons because they usually have a high electronegativity. But they're still not happy. They are still not a noble gas. Even though oxygen has six valence electrons, and even though oxygen has a relatively high electronegativity, he still doesn't have eight electrons. He is still not a noble gas, so he is still not happy. So basically what they're going to do, they are going to share an electron with somebody else who is also in the same situation. So since they both need help from each other, it's like a win-win situation. I'll give you, it's like you guys are going to share a soda. You have 50 cents and your friend has 50 cents and you guys want a soda that costs a dollar. So maybe you put your money together and then you share the soda. Sharing. All right, so let's look at an example. Here we have fluorine. How many valence electrons does fluorine have? Seven, how do I know that? He's in the seventh column. Let's take a seventh, a second fluorine. How many electrons does this fluorine have? Seven, how do I know that? He's in the seventh column. Is either one of these guys happy? No. So, the fluorine on the left needs one electron. The fluorine on the right needs one electron. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to be like, okay, let's move closer and closer and closer and closer together until our orbitals overlap and now we can share. So right there in the middle, they are sharing those electrons and they both have a full orbital some of the time. So this guy is happy 50% of the time. This guy is happy 50% of the time which is better than being unhappy all of the time, correct? So they are sharing that electron. However, writing molecular formulas is not as easy as it was when we did ionic bonding. Remember with ionic bonding, we found the charge, and then we made the charge neutral, and then we could figure out how many hydrogens we needed and how many oxygens we needed, so on and so forth, right? 
Molecular formulas aren't as easy because molecules don't have charges. So if they don't have charges, how can we figure it out? Well, my best answer is for you, you just have to draw them out. Sometimes you can do it in your head. Sometimes you just have to draw them out. So for instance, the chemical formula of a molecular compound shows how many atoms of each element a molecule contains. So like H2O says we have two hydrogens and one oxygen. And CO2 says we have one carbon and two oxygens. But CH6 says we have two carbons and H for six hydrogens. And, but if you notice, aren't we dealing with the same three elements? Doesn't H2O look similar to CO2? Doesn't CO2 look similar to C2H6? We're dealing with the same series of elements. It's just all in how they bond with each other. So in covalent bonding, there's often more than one right answer. Ionic bonding, there was always one right answer. Covalent bonding, there's lots of different answers. Okay. Does anyone know what C2H6 is? Methane. Well, ethane, technically. Methane is CH3. Ethane is C2H6. It's like a gas. Methane is what's natural gases. All right. So molecular formulas reflect the actual number of atoms in each molecule. However, it doesn't tell you how it's arranged. It doesn't tell you in what spot is which atom. It doesn't tell you which atom comes first, so on and so forth. It just tells you the number. So if it doesn't tell you, Jordan, if it doesn't tell you what it looks like, then how do we know, right? Well, we just kind of have to mess around with it until we figure it out. And so, first of all, we create things, and it has a really, really, really fancy name. They're called ball and stick models for obvious reasons, right? This is a ball and stick model. It is made out of balls and sticks. Okay, each sphere, sorry, every time I say that you guys giggle, each sphere has a number of holes in it, okay? Representing how many times they can bond. So hydrogen can only bond once, so I choose a sphere that only has one hole in it so that I can only make one bond with it, okay? Nitrogen, however, can bond three times, so I choose a sphere that has three holes in it. And then basically you bond them together until there are no more holes present. So no more holes are present. So we are nice and happy now. Okay, so this is a ball and stick model. But I don't know about you guys, but I don't really carry these around in my pocket. Right? So we need a way to draw these on paper, correct? So let's look at the next slide. Okay. The molecular formula shows how many atoms of each element are present. The structural formula also shows the arrangement of the atoms. This is what we need to do when we're drawing it on paper. And I'm going to show you guys how to make these in just a second. And this is what I just showed you that I made using the model. But they all three are telling you the same information, right? They're telling you you have one nitrogen and three hydrogens. The Okay, this model is showing you where, what valence electrons where. So there's probably, here's one, two, three bonds, correct? And this one's telling you geometrically that it's not, this one's showing you straight across, correct? But this one's showing you that, oh, it's not quite straight across. There is a different angle going on there, right? So each one shows you a little bit different information, but at the same time, it's the same information, just presented just a little bit differently. So just to refresh our memory, we need to follow the octet rule. However, we can't follow the octet rule like we did in ionic compounds because we not, cannot gain or lose electrons. So in other words, they are going to share except for hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium only want two, so they are not going to 
follow the octet rule. They're going to follow the rule of two. So, in covalent compounds or molecular compounds, they can form different types of bonds. A single bond shares one pair of electrons. A double bond shares two pairs of electrons. And a triple bond shares three pairs of electrons. Really entertaining names, right? Totally makes sense, don't they? And I were to do an example really quick. We're going to do water as an example. And the reason I want to do water as an example is because you guys already know the chemical formula for water. So it's not going to be a stretch. We're just going to learn how to draw something when you already know the chemical formula. Okay? So, as soon as everyone's done. All right, so let's see here. Let's do for H2O. So the first question is, how do I know which atom to start with? Do I need to draw hydrogen first or I need to draw oxygen first? And my answer to you is to start with the guy who can make more bonds. So how do I know who can make more bonds? Let's start with oxygen. Oxygen has six valence electrons. How do I know that? He's in the six column, so I'm going to draw him with six dots. He has six valence electrons. Hydrogen, however, only has how many? One. Are these electrons going to make bonds? No. Are these electrons going to make bonds? No. It is going to be this electron and this electron because they are not in a pair. So how many times can oxygen bond? Twice. How many times can hydrogen bond? Once. Hydrogen can bond once, oxygen can bond twice. So I would start with oxygen because oxygen can bond more times than hydrogen. So what I do is I draw one of each. Draw, drew oxygen, I drew hydrogen. And then hydrogen on the left needs one more additional electron, correct? This pair over here needs one more additional electron. So they are going to share, and we represent this by honestly just connecting the dots. Connect the dots, it's telling me that I am sharing these electrons between hydrogen and oxygen, which means half the time they are around hydrogen and half the time they are around oxygen. So <coughs> is hydrogen happy? Yep. Is oxygen happy? No. So do I need to add another hydrogen or do I need to add another oxygen? Add another hydrogen. And again, connect the dots. Is this hydrogen happy now? Yes. Is oxygen happy now? Yes. yes. So this is the structure for water. And we need, we're going to learn how to draw these. We're going to spend lots and lots of time drawing them tomorrow and next week. Okay. But baby steps, right? Okay. So I always like to show this. Because there are different ways to denote single, double, and triple bonds. Okay? How many lines do you see on number one? One. So this is going to represent a single bond. That means between this carbon and this carbon, we are sharing one pair of electrons. Okay? So between this carbon and this carbon, we see two lines. So how many pairs do you think they're sharing? They're sharing two, so this is a double bond. And between this carbon and this carbon, how many lines do we see? Three. So what kind of bond is it? A triple. And if you notice, as our bonds increase, what happens to our hydrogen? They were decreasing. Why? Because there were less electrons available to do bonding. All right, so let's do a little bit of practice. All right, so first of all, Let's draw the Lewis dot structure for each of these molecules. So what is the Lewis dot structure? How do I do that again? You put the symbol of the element, and then you put the number of dots representing the number of valence electrons, or a.k.a. the column they are in on the periodic table, right? So what's the symbol for bromine? Br. 
So I would write, how many dots does bromine get? He's in the seventh column, so he gets seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, does it matter where I start when I draw my dots? No. Does it matter which ones I pair? No. The only thing that matters is that you fill one before you pair them. It doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter where the paired electrons are as long as you put one in each orbital before you pair them. Okay, so what's the chemical symbol for oxygen? O. How many dots does oxygen get? Six. Six. So he's in the sixth column. So one, two, three, four, five, six. All right? And nitrogen. What's the symbol for nitrogen? How many dots does he get? So one, two, three, four, five. So, which one of these guys can bond more? Nitrogen. Nitrogen can make three bonds right here and right here and right here. Oxygen can make two bonds right here and right here. And bromine can only make one there on the left. All right, so now let's do number eight. Number eight says the following molecules have single covalent bonds. Draw an electron dot diagram for each. So this time we're going to do H2O2, not H2O. And we're going to do PCl3. Does anybody know what H2O2 is? Hydrogen peroxide. You get a purple dollar in a second. Okay, H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Yes. Uh-huh. Let's do it in just mm, we'll do it in just a second. And then I'll show you guys. Okay. Alright, so let's do H two O two first. I'll figure out what way you were taught and then I'll Let's do H2O2 first. So who should we start with? Should we start with hydrogen or should we start with oxygen? <coughs> oxygen. Why should we start with oxygen? It can bond more time. So I'm going to draw oxygen. And oxygen has how many valence electrons? Six. Six. So one, two, three, four. And I'm going to draw it just a little bit differently this time. And you're going to see why in just a second. I, like I said before, it doesn't matter where you put the paired electrons as long as we have the same number of paired electrons, right? So... But we have not one oxygen, we have two oxygens. So we are going to draw our second one over here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So now do you guys see why I drew them that way? Why did I draw it that way? So that you can see that there's probably going to be a bond right here in the center. And how did I know that they needed to be bonded together? Because all four of these atoms have to be bonded to each other. So if we bonded hydrogen to one of the oxygens, then the other oxygen would be left out in the cold. If we bonded the hydrogens to the second oxygen, then the first oxygen wouldn't have, we wouldn't have room to bond him. So we have to have some way to bond everybody together. So now we still have two places in which we can make a bond, right? Which correlates to the two hydrogens that we need to find a home for. So hydrogen's going to go right here, and then there's a bond. Hydrogen's right here. And then there's a bond. Everybody is following the octet rule, correct? Everybody's happy. So now let's try the next one. Let's try PCl3. So I need to determine who do I need to start with. So who should I start with? Okay, phosphorus has five valence electrons, right? One, two, three four, five. So he can bond how many times? He can bond one, two, three times, correct? Chlorine, however, only has seven. So he can only bond one time. So my phosphorus is going to go in the center. 
because it can bond more times. So, and if you guys notice, as I draw, and you'll get better at this the more times you do it, but as I draw them, I move around my valence electrons to make it as easy as possible. Because it doesn't matter where your paired electrons are as long as they're paired. So as we get better and better at drawing these, you guys will learn to do it. I can do it in my head now. I can see ahead of time how I need to arrange things, but you'll get better at it the more you draw. So then, where should I put another chlorine at? At the bottom. Where should its unpaired electron go? At the top. Where should my third one go? To the left. Where should my unpaired electron go? Is everybody happy? Yes, everybody is following the octet rule. Everybody has a certain number of bonds that they need. Everybody's connected. We are good to go. So, the next, another question that several students asked me last hour was, how do I know that I put P before CL? Because an ionic bond, and we put our metal first and our nonmetal second. But both of these are nonmetal, so how do I know which to put first? Do I put the P in front of CL or not? With H2O, how did I know to put H in front of O when we learned hydroxide and it was OH? Why did I do that? Well, when it comes to molecular compounds, you, name, you put them in the order they are on the periodic table. H is to the left of oxygen, correct? So he gets listed first. Okay? P is to the left of chlorine, so he gets listed first. So you just kind of read it. Whoever's to the left gets listed first. Okay? How do we feel about this? Let's do one more example. I want to do carbon dioxide. Everybody knows what carbon dioxide is. You exhale it every single day, right? So first of all, I need to figure out who needs to go in the center. So who's going to go in the center, carbon or oxygen? Carbon. Why is it carbon? <laughs> because carbon has how many valence electrons? Four. So how many bonds can he make? Four. Oxygen has how many valence electrons? So how many bonds can he make? Two. Two. So carbon's going to go in the central, in the center, because he can bond more times, right? So I'm going to put carbon right here, and I'm going to show you his four valence electrons. Then I'm going to put ox one oxygen on each side, and each oxygen gets six. Okay, right off the bat, it's pretty... Right off the bat, it's pretty obvious that these are going to connect to each other, right? Yep. But then we still have people that are not happy, correct? Right. So, but at the same time, but at the same time, we can see that this oxygen still has one unbound electron, this carbon still has two, and this oxygen still has one. So basically, we're going to do a double bond. So instead of oxygen and carbon just sharing one pair of electrons, they are going to share two. Instead of the second carbon and oxygen sharing one pair of electrons, they are going to share two. And oftentimes, I'm okay if you guys draw it like this because then you don't have to do any erasing, but in a book or on a test or whatever, you actually will see it similar to you'll actually see it look like So both ways, I'm okay with you giving it either way. I don't really care which way you give it to me, but I want you to be able to read both ways. All right? All right, so no homework. We're going to do some practice tomorrow in class. So hopefully you guys are all ready for that.